In this video, I'll explain as simply as I can what the curvature is of a surface. Okay, so we start with a local situation. Uh, so, so in this very, very simplified situation where you're looking at surfaces of the following type. So Z equals AX squared plus BY squared. It's quite simple to understand what, what curvature is. So here, we're looking at the family of these graphs. You get very different uh, surfaces depending on what the, the values of A and B are, specifically their signature. Right, so in, in case A and B are positive, then you get the uh, so-called, I think, par paraboloid. If A and B are both negative, then you get, the, I suppose, the upside down paraboloid. If the signs are alternating, then you get these type of saddle surfaces, uh, hyperbolic paraboloid, I believe they were called. And then there's also the degenerate cases where either one or both a and, of a and B are zero, right? So if only one of them is zero, then you get these type of, uh, you know, valley type of graph where you always have sort of a flat direction. I call them, you know, flat valleys for lack of a better term. Here in this case, I suppose this is the case when, uh, uh, when uh, the, the flat direction goes uh, in this direction. Now, if both A and B are zero, then the graph is, uh, just the X or Y plane. Okay, so here we make a definition about the curvature of these surfaces at the point P equals zero. So at the origin, right? So, so each of these surfaces contains the point at the origin. And then we make this following definition that I'll try to explain that kind of makes sense. So I declare the curvature at the point P equals zero to be four times AB. Might as well call this the Gauss curvature with a bit of uh, foresight. About to come next. But before we move on, what does this definition really mean for each of these surfaces, right? And then let's just focus on the sign. So for the shapes on the very left, right? It's easy to see that the curvature is positive. So whether it's an upside down parabola or it's a reg so it's wh whether it's a paraboloid or upside down paraboloid, in both cases, at the pointed end, you have positive curvature. In the middle, right, in these type of saddle situations, the curvature is negative. And then when you have a flat direction, the curvature is always going to be zero. So let's just sort of uh, uh, remember these words, right? So, so positive curvature means sort of pointy. Negative curvature means saddle. And then flatness means, uh, uh, I suppose, sort of flat direction. All right, so let's keep the, this, uh, this in mind, all these words and this very intuitive definition. And then let's see how this can be expanded to a situation of a uh, general surface in R3. So let me move down here. Okay, so that's, that's what's coming up next, right? So now I'm taking a general surface uh, embedded into R3. So I don't know, call this your, your favorite potato right here. And I'm picking up a point on my surface and I uh, want to understand how I could define the curvature of S at P. So this is the next goal. So what's the curvature S at P? And perhaps the first uh, sort of uh, simple goal would be really to define if this point here P on S is pointy, saddle, or flat. And intuitively, this is very clear uh, which points are pointy, saddle, or flat, but we want to get a really precise understanding. So for that, perhaps the easiest thing to do first is understand this notion of uh, tangential uh, uh, charts and tangential parametrization. This is, this is very simple. So at the point P, 
you know that there exists a tangent plane attached uh, to S, uh, hugging S at the point P. So by applying a rigid motion here, uh, which in this case will be a combination, a composition of a rotation and a uh, translation, you can make sure that P actually becomes the origin. And you also wanna make sure that the tangent play, plane is actually the X or Y plane. Now, wh when you do this, obviously this sort of potato turns upside down and uh, you're in this fortunate situation that at least near, near P, near P here, you can write S as the graph of a certain very special function, what's going on. So it's easy to see that S projects very nicely onto the tangent space uh, TPS, which is just X or Y plane. And this projection is going to be a diffeomorphism near P. So projection S onto uh, X or Y. And then a tangential chart will be nothing but the inverse of this projection, right? So, and that, that's what I'm calling. So S near P, I want it to be the graph of some function, capital G from negative one times, neg so, so, so this interval times this interval onto S, where really this rectangle here, this rectangle is nothing but this rectangle that I try to sort of sketch onto inside the tangent tangent space. Okay, so we have these so-called tangential charts. Here. For every point in S and they're very, very simple to understand. Now it turns out that these tangential charts allow to uh, transfer the discussion of the curvature of S back to the local situation. What's going on? Okay, so still with our tangential chart. Uh, so then S near P is equal to the graph of this uh, uh, function G. Now, by definition, by how we set th things up, G at the origin is equal to zero. Also, because this potato is completely upside down and the tangent at, at the origin is the X or Y plane, then the origin in R3, has to be an extremal point of G, meaning the Jacobian, so all the first order partials of G at the origin all vanish. So these two, these two facts here imply something very simple about the function capital G. Namely, if I expand it into Taylor series, the first terms I pick up are all from the Hessian of G. And then I have some third order terms and above. Let's just say I don't care about them. Uh, the, the, information about the curvature is all hidden in, in, in this uh, Hessian of G. So the Hessian, what do we know about them? So this is a two by two matrix that's uh, symmetric. So uh, a bit of linear algebra wisdom tells you that if you're a two by two real valued symmetric uh, matrix, then you have real eigenvalues. And to such real eigenvalues, you can associate eigenvectors, let's call them U and V, where the eigenvalues are lambda one, lambda two. And moreover, you can pick U and V so that it forms an orthonormal basis in, in R2. Now, whenever you have an orthonormal basis, you're, you're always very tempted to make a change of variables. So that's what I'm doing here, where the columns here are coming from U and V. So X and Y will become X prime, Y prime. And then what happens? Well, if I go back to the Taylor series expansion of capital G, then what's going to happen is that the second order term here are, is going to be diagonalized in very simple terms. Namely, I get this expression in X prime, Y prime, where, oops, so this should be a three here. And then once you're in this situation, then, 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 uh, uh, then uh, what do you see? Well, the graph of G is almost that of uh, a, uh, one of the local models, right? So, so what you can say uh, very intuitively that this local model Z prime equals lambda one 
x prime square lambda two y prime say y prime square sort of hugs hugs uh, g x prime y prime meaning that they're the same up to a third order term so it makes sense for you to define the curvature of s at p to be nothing but four times lambda one lambda two and then this is really what's called in the literature usually in very very different terms the gaussian curvature of s at p and then there's some additional words here right so we also get these very uh, uh, important quantities lambda one lambda two these are called the principal curvatures of s at p and also u and v are the principal directions of s at p so so namely say you're in a situation where k so if uh, k s p is let's say negative so locally your your uh, surface looks like a saddle then the directions u and v in, in, in the tangent space uh, at p will give you essentially the directions of, of the saddle. So a, a similar, but perhaps uh, sort of less, uh, slightly less relevant situation also goes on in, in the pointy situation where uh, uh, the curvature is positive, but perhaps the, the significance of these principal directions is, is slightly less, uh, less clear from the intuitive point of view. Okay, so this, uh, I believe, gives you a very, very good description of what curvature is uh, of a surface in, in very, very simple terms. Now, the only thing that I want to explain in this video is uh, a computational example, right? So simple means that it should be simple in terms of uh, computational examples as well. So let's go with something that uh, uh, a, a surface whose curvature we understand. And let's see if this description allows for an easy, uh, an easy uh, method to obtain uh, the curvature. So what could be more simple than the actual sphere? And then we want to compute the curvature at the South Pole. So really quickly, you set up the tangential parametrization there. Right, so this is the uh, equation giving you the sphere of radius r. So from here, the tangential parametrization at the p equals south pole is going to be this one. And uh, what you want to do to obtain the curvature at the south pole is you want to find out the second order Taylor expansion of, of this uh, function here, which is your g x y. So, I mean, there's a million ways to do this. I chose to pu pull out an R here and examine this expression. So what's helpful if you go this route is to do the side calculation where you do the first order Taylor expansion of negative one, uh, negative square root one minus T plus one, uh, where, where T is uh, uh, sort of positive, or sorry, so, so T could be from negative one to one. Uh, calculus tells you that this is the first order Taylor expansion. Now let T be this uh, more complicated expression here, X square over R square plus Y square over R square. You put it in, then you get the second order Taylor series expansion of, of Z. Uh, the error here will be of order four, which is perfectly fine because we need something that's at least order three. And then after a bit of simplification, you get to this expression. So then you just read off the curvature. Uh, so the curvature at the South Pole, let's call capital S, is four times one over two R, that's your lambda one, times one over two R, that's your lambda two. So the curvature is one over R square, which is positive, right? Uh, so the bigger the radius of a sphere, then the smaller its, uh, its curvature is. Right, so a very small, but but still positive, right? So that's uh, definitely uh, need need to be kept in mind. All right, thank you very much for your attention, and see you in the next video.